Morning, it's so good to be with you here in the house of the Lord. This past week, I was in Washington, D.C. for the Act Now to End Racism rally that the National Council of Churches put on. I got to see a lot of old, old friends. And this morning, I get to be with you and get to see a lot of what I hope will be new friends. Um, and so the one question that I have, though, is where can I get one of these cool T-shirts? Uh, because I'm, I'm seeing a lot of them out here, and so I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm planting the seed. I want one of these T-shirts. But, <laughs> but it's so good to be with you, uh, to see your beautiful faces, to have gotten to meet some of you over coffee, um, and I'm just going to invite you uh, to come before the Lord with me this morning. Holy God, we give you thanks for this time that you have given us to be together, to dance together in your presence for the ways that you are dancing in our community, inviting us to be a part of it. We pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I was telling folks at the first service that um, I, when I saw the the title that I'd been given for this sermon, that I was, I was kind of had to chuckle to myself because I grew up in an environment where dancing was not allowed. And so I didn't really get to have those skills and learn those things. And so it's always something that's kind of an insecurity for me. Like you will never hear me say to my friends, let's go dancing. Um, but I have learned over time to let loose and to uh, accept the freedom that is given to us through dancing. Um, but yeah, so I never got to learn those dances that you learn at a certain age. Like I saw one of the young people who's gone off to children's church now out in the lobby before this doing, doing this thing. What is this thing? Does anyone, any of y'all, what, wait, like this? Do it, do it, do it. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> So, so that is the dance. Uh, I clearly don't know how to do it. Um, uh, but I know that e- many of you have that dance that you learned to do at a certain age, whether last service somebody got up and showed us how to do the twist. Um, and uh, we know there's the jitterbug. I don't know. Does anybody want to shout out some dances that they know from their childhood? Mambo. The what? Mambo. The mambo. Holly. The holly? Okay, so we're going to have the what? The swim. Yes. So we're going to have a dance after the service while we're packing food. Uh, you all can show off your moves. Thank you for showing us whatever this, this thing is. I don't know. <laughs> she, she's like, no, no. <laughs> but thank you for, thank you for your, your offering of those. And I do hope we'll get to see some, some more moves later on. Um, so uh, dancing in public, as I've said, uh, makes me nervous, and yet at the same time, um, there's something contagious and irresistible about it, right? Like, for most of us, no matter how determined we are to be the wallflower at the event, there's always that one song. Most of us have that one song that, that we just, even if, even if it just means tapping our toe, we just cannot resist that one song. For my family, it was Aretha Franklin's R-E-S-P-E-C-T. And so I have four siblings. That means there's been four weddings. Um, And so, you know, woe be to the DJ who did not play Aretha Franklin for us. Uh, and when we heard that, that's the, those notes start going, we would all converge from all corners of the room wherever we were eating chocolate-covered strawberries or chatting with friends and converge on the dance floor to sing it at the top of our lungs because dance is contagious and irresistible and it speaks to our hearts. When we hear it, we can't sit still. Dance transcends time and place and language, and it brings us together. We find ourselves dancing to songs when we don't even know the words, but we know the rhythm. We find ourselves moving in synchronicity with other human beings without ever having practiced what we're going to do together, but our bodies move to the rhythm that's somehow inside of us. On social media media today, who's on social media? I know, I know, I know there's a few. On social media today, there's dances that will just spread around the world because one person will make a video of the movements, right, and it ends up on YouTube or Facebook, and then everybody else is making their, their version of it, putting it up on a dance challenge on Instagram or something like that. And a dance within just a day can kind of spread around the world through technology these days, and the whole world starts to dance together in unison. People of every corner of the world moving together in syncopated, coordinated movements. All it takes is one person in a crowd who is brave enough 
to start to move to the music. And suddenly, other movements start to appear. Ripples start to move. People begin to bounce and sway. Dance is contagious. It's natural. It's freedom. It's what's inside of us coming out. And so should our worship be. And that's the passage that we hear today from David as what is inside of him, it comes out, and he's reckless and unashamed before God. My stiff upbringing got shaken out of me when I worked at congregations where music meant movement. So have you all ever been to those churches where, you know, the whole pew starts to move together as the music sways, and maybe you add like a, a dip, 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 and a clap, and it's, it, it, the whole room starts to move like a wave at a baseball game. These are the kind of churches I have worked at where dozens of bodies are moving in unison like birds in a flock adjusting to one another's movement and imitating one another. And I learned to shake off my stiffness and dance before the Lord. To dance in private, uh, as I like to do to Miriam Makiba's Pata Pata from Mama Africa CD, is a joyous act, but to dance in public is a whole other thing. It is a vulnerable act, an act that invites others to join, an act that by inviting others to join risks rejection, right? So it can be a scary act, an act that invites others to imitate, to join in the ripple and the flow, and thus risks that they will misinterpret it. Or, on the other hand, that they will improve upon it, right? It is an act of the highest expression of joy and freedom and release. And in it we risk the judgment of man, but we receive the glory of God. That is exactly what David receives in this passage from Second Samuel Because not in the pericope that we read, but in the verses after, we see what happens when he gets home from from this after party that he has been having with his friends. Because, you know, they had been off on it, working for years. He had just been crowned king, and they had had, uh, gone to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. So they'd been through all this stuff together. You know when you've been through something with people and you have the after party afterwards, whether it's a play or a production... Or, or a fair that you've put on, and you kind of celebrate with people afterwards. So this is the after party. So David has been celebrating at the after party, giving food out to everybody, and he gets home, and the scriptures say that while his wife was watching him from the tower, she was despising him in her heart. And when he gets home, she tells him that he is a vulgar fellow who's embarrassed himself and the family, right? Yet David wasn't dancing for her, was he? David responds that it was before the Lord that he danced. It was for the Lord's approval alone that David was seeking. So he had taken off his royal attire, and as the scriptures say, he was dancing in a linen ephod. So he, instead of being in the position of the master, had taken on the position of the servant, right? He had shown that he was in submission to God through what he was wearing. He wasn't concerned about holding on to and maintaining his power as the most important thing, right? His worldly power was not the most important thing to him. Instead, it was to show his submission, his position as a servant to God. So he had been wearing this linen ephod, distancing himself from his own power, his own coolness, and recklessly dancing in the streets, out in the open before God. He had taken his worship out of the privacy of his home, out of, the, out of the bathroom where he sang in the shower. He had taken it out of the pew and out of the church and right out into the streets where anybody could see the love that he had for God because he had something to celebrate. As they had been engaging in this celebration and this after party, uh, they'd been bringing the Ark of the Covenant up, and it was even a fearful thing. You know, there was a guy named Uz, Uzzah, it says, who accidentally touched the Ark. Do you remember this part? Right before this, he accidentally touched the ark and he actually died because there's so much power. So there's something exciting and powerful and dangerous about what is going on. 
And yet David does not avoid this power. He acknowledges the power of God, but he doesn't avoid it. He moves into it. He leans into God's power rather than his own, dancing wildly, clothed like a servant, acknowledging that all of his worldly power did not change the fact that he was nothing more than a servant of God. This vulnerability, this scandalous behavior from someone who who should have been cool and aloof disgusted his wife, Michal, who had been raised by King Saul, right, to believe that there is a proper way of doing things, right? A proper way for people with power to act. Dancing opens us up to vulnerability and to mockery. Acknowledging our love for God is an unapologetic act, though, We can't be worried about whether people will approve of our love for God or how we express it. We cannot be afraid of losing our cool or losing being seen as cool. Dancing also opens us up to community. It opens us up to unity and to relationship, to laughter and to joy. Scientists speak of these things called mirror neurons. So what it is is that there's parts of our brain that we enjoy dancing and watching somebody else dance and seeing how we can kind of predict what moves they're going to make. Like that gives us an enjoyment that we can predict another person's behavior. And what gives us even more enjoyment is when we fail to predict it and they do something even cooler than we thought they were going to do. They come up with a move that we didn't expect. So we enjoy being able to predict what they're going to do and then we're like, whoa, when they do something even more than what we predicted, right? So it's these mirror neurons of being neurologically connected to somebody else during dance, taking pleasure from the ways that our bodies are moving together, but also pleasure on the creativity that each of us can offer. David's dancing was an expression of his own uniqueness, his creativity and his vulnerability before God. He danced for the approval of God, not for the approval of humans. And he, as we've heard, received resistance for it, right? So, newsflash, when you prioritize God and your love for God and your service of God over other people's approval, you will receive resistance. Has anybody, has anybody, has anybody experienced that? Yeah? You may look like a fool at times to the world, but do it anyway, right? What do we have to lose? There's this video uh, uh, which is on social media of this guy at the Sasquatch Music Festival. And everybody's kind of sitting on the grass at this outdoor music festival and there's blankets, right? And this one crazy guy is on the corner just going like, and just breaking it down, right? And everybody's kind of like, you know, looking askance at him. But then one more person joins him and then they're dancing together. And then another person joins him And then another person. And then it just starts to take over the whole crowd. People are jumping up because they're terrified of being left out of this amazing thing that's starting to take place. And this thing that at first looked strange and unacceptable has suddenly become something that everybody wants to be a part of because dance is contagious, right? And so the person who's holding the camera almost gets knocked over because people are just sprinting from all directions, pushing and shoving to get into this circle of dance and joy not needing to have the directions or the moves, but just wanting to be a part of the movement, each offering the beauty and the strangeness of what they have that makes community. There is an amazing power when we dance together that draws other people in. It just takes one, then two, then three, and suddenly we're all getting drawn into what's happening, bringing our creativity and our vulnerability and our knowledge and our uniqueness So what does it look like when a community operates as if we are dancing together with all our power? As if we are willing to offer what we know how to do, our unique moves, our unique knowledge of the swim. And what's this thing? What's this thing called? The floss? The floss. Of the of the swim and the floss and, and, and all of the gifts that we have in our unique ways and offering them to the whole, willing to offer what we know how to do and take the risk of whether it will be accepted or not. And what does it look like to create a community that doesn't reject any of it, right? 
that looks at things that may be different and says, well, how can we include this and make what we're doing even more beautiful by adding all this oddness and strangeness that each of us bring into something so beautiful? What if a community looks at one another as if to embrace the unexpected and the different, to see what can be made of the rough edges and the unique contributions? What if our focus is not the approval of the world, of Macau up in her tower, but of God? At our Wednesday uh, night event that we have with Fe en la Frontera, uh, so Wesley Foundation, uh, Frontera Wesley, at, at, down in, in Tucson, which I serve, serves the Pima campuses and the U of A. And on Wednesday nights, we have a Bible study on the campus of the U of A called Fe en la Frontera, Faith on the Border. And it's taught by one of our interns, Pelo Rojas. And we know at Faith on the Border that things have started to kind of become this incredible dance. Last week, we actually asked people to commit and to become a circle, to dance together for the rest of their time in college. And so this circle of people that are so different have created such a beautiful dance together. We know that we can always count on Dakota to bring up some completely different point because she didn't grow up in the same kind of churches that we did. And she's going to bring up something that's going to kind of make us teary and make us see things differently, and always bring something new. And we know that Perla is always going to bring something to us that's going to help us to see the scriptures differently, because as an immigrant in, our, in this land, as somebody who has traveled, she identifies with the wandering people of Israel and our wandering Savior, Jesus Christ, and she can understand the things that Jesus experienced through her own experiences in ways that we can't, and we always know we're going to learn something powerful from her. And we always know that Jake is going to bring up something to do with numbers, whether it's money or statistics, Jake is always going to bring numbers into it and give us a whole new framework for looking at things and, and take something that might seem boring and make it seem really interesting. And so I have been learning so much through the dance of this group together. I have been in ministry for, uh, 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 since I was about 18, so about 17 years. And I have been, or come, I'm in my sixth year of ordination, and yet I'm coming to see Jesus in a completely different way. I'm coming to know Jesus in a completely different way through watching this group dance together and seeing the things that they can come to, the things that they can understand through each of them bringing these different perspectives and us being able to see something new that we never could have seen alone, right? But through the movement of the group together, we are able to see something new. And I have my view of God changing as never before. And on Thursday nights, we have dinner communion, and there's been a different kind of dance that's been taking place there over the past couple months, a dance of pens and pencils and crayons across paper, um, because at the beginning of Black History Month, on the first day of Black History Month, the Black Student Association always has a silent vigil for Trayvon Martin, and this year, most of our Wesley students found their way out to it to stand in solidarity with our Black Student Association. And one of our students is an artist, and he saw the different posters that people had, and he said, boy, I wish that I had known that I could create art, that this was a place for art. And so he said, well, it's not too late. So in the 10 or 20 minutes that, before we have dinner at Wesley each Thursday, he started creating a masterpiece on this big sheet of paper that we would have on the dining room table. He was drawing a portrait of a woman with a beautiful, inspiring quote to give as a gift to the Black Student Association and appreciation for the experience that he had with them at that event. And what the other students started to notice was it was a big piece of paper. And we don't have many weeks left in this year. And so they all started to join him and to dance together across that paper. And MK started with the flowers coming up from one corner, and Chelsea with the flowers from another corner. And some friend of his that we didn't even know came and added a flower in the woman's hair. And a beautiful portrait was created through the community dancing together through their, their art. And when it was finished last week, we were able to dance across campus and deliver it to the Martin Luther King Center. And the Black Student Association has it on their wall as a sign of Wesley's love and support for them and the way that we spent two months dancing together through art to create that for them. And they know the time and the love that went into it. And perhaps the most beautiful dance that we've seen take place this year happened right before Christmas. I don't know if you all know that there is a Methodist mission that's like practically on campus. It's like 
just cross two lanes of traffic from campus and you're at one of our Methodist missions, um, the In Project, which is a focus of this district's ministry. And at the In Project, we house folks that have, um, are asylum seekers that have been f fleeing for safety and have just been released from detention. We, we make sure that they have food and safety and a place to sleep while they prepare for their continued travel to be with family. And so that's right next door to my office. It's right across from campus. And some of our students, in interacting with the people there right before Christmas, they realized that one of the young women <clears throat> was about to turn 15. Does anyone know why that's important? Quintanera, right. So one of the women who was there was about to turn 15, and she had been saving up money to have a quinceanera in the country that she was in before she had to flee. And now she was about to turn 15 with no quinceanera. And for the students, I didn't understand, but for the students that understood what that meant, they were determined that that could not happen. So she was about to turn, uh, she was about to have to leave the next day, they found out. So they talked to her at 7 o'clock. They said, when are you leaving? Maybe we have a week. We'll get all our friends together. We'll have our, our guy friends be the gentlemen and all of that. And she says, I'm leaving tomorrow right after lunchtime. And it seemed like something impossible, but except for this group knew how to dance. And so one young woman went and she got her own quinceanera dress and she tailored it to fit the young woman. And another went and got her hair and makeup supplies. Some of us went to shop for a quinceanera Bible and ring and a cake, a tres leches cake. And the mothers of the girls started to cook dinner to make a feast for the next day. The news started to spread around town, and a woman came and set up her own photo booth. One of the best DJs in Tucson heard about it, and he came and set up his equipment and started the music going so that we could play her favorite songs. Some of the bishops just happened to be in town for a meeting, and they asked if they could come serenade her with the traditional song that she was to be serenaded with. So she got serenaded by the bishops of the Methodist Church. So we went, we went from having no quinceanera to just within 12 hours having a really amazing, powerful, and really historic experience for her. And that is what happens when we dance together, when we offer all those little pieces of what we can do um, to make something happen, right? And as the DJ played her favorite songs and everybody joined on the dance floor, people who would never see one another again became family for just one day for her, right? People who would never see each other before and would never see each other again for one day became family. When we dance together like this, where does the power that we dance with truly come from? It comes from our ability to obey God's call to love and compassion and to place that above all else, above our differences and our opinions and understand that God's call to love and compassion is what we are to be known for by for Christ said, they will know you are my followers because of your love. This power comes from the worship and the creativity that we offer in imitation of our creator. For when we worship God, we seek to imitate. And we serve a creative God whose central and first act was creation. So when we create, we give glory we are a mirror. We are an imitator of our God. This power comes from offering up our gifts because our need to give to God is greater than our concern about whether what we have to give will be good enough, will be appreciated enough, right? Because we know that if God gave it to us, then it is good enough to give back to God, right? This power comes from our trust that what we have to offer is precisely what is needed, even if we don't quite yet understand how. I tell the Wesley students that we need to know each other's moves. We need to know what each is good at, right? We need to know who knows how to do the swim and who knows how to do the floss so that when we need somebody who knows how to do that, we can call upon them. We need to work like a team to solve the problems that we have as a community. We have to trust each other to know that maybe the move we make will be different from the moves that other people are making, but it will contribute to the whole of what we are creating. And when we learn to work together like that, we can make the impossible happen. 
I know that this community knows what it means to dance together. I've heard of the things that you guys do. And I know how you dance together in this community and in this building and how you bring together your skills. That is the power that can arise when we're brave enough to be vulnerable with each other and to offer our skills and our gifts and our times and our resources and our sacrifices to one another. So I leave you this week with a different question to think about as your dancing series continues, which is what does it look like when we, like David, take our dance outside of the privacy of our home, outside of the privacy of our sanctuary even, and take it out into the streets where everybody can see our passion and our compassion, our gifts and our vulnerability? What does it look like to worship God outside of these four walls, to show our obedience, our submission, our creativity, our vulnerability, our compassion and our joy right out in the open, right out in the streets of our community? If we can change things in this building by dancing together, imagine what we can change out in this community, in this city, in this state when we truly dance together in love and compassion and vulnerability, how might that love and vulnerability and curiosity and compassion, how might all of that, when we offer it together, be the means of changing everything? Thanks be to God. Amen.